Welcome back to theCUBE's coverage of ISC High Performance 2023, where we're covering all things HPC. We've been reporting for years that AI and HPC are coming together in a big way, and we've seen that accelerate in 2023. Organizations are trying to figure out how to apply the potential of foundation models like GPT to make them more productive. The question is, how do they do it? How do they make it work for their business? And in this segment, we're going to dig into the how-tos and detailing recent advancements from the industry and specifically from Dell and how to implement generative AI for your business. And we're going to double click on AI and maybe even touch on security. And with me here is Ben Faber, who's PhD and senior AI research scientist at Dell Technologies. Ben, good to see you. Thanks for coming on. Great to see you too. Thank you for having me on. You're welcome. All right, first question. I had this conversation the other day with, uh, with an AI expert. Is ChatGPT AI in your view? And is it representative of what generative AI offers or, or is, it, is there more to it? Yeah, I, I think that's a great question. Um, I think it's representative of a, a very impressive tool in artificial intelligence right now. It falls into a subfield of generative AI. Um, there's there's a broader field that does other things, but in the space of generative AI, where the goal is to generate new content that's similar to the content that the model was trained on, uh, I think it's a very impressive tool. And it's specific right now to the language space, right? Text, um, human prose, things that we typically think of as, as language uh, it falls in that space. Although there are expanded capabilities with new iterations where it can ingest images and, and tell you a little bit about what's in an image. Uh, but there's another side of it out there, the generative AI story um, that has to do with image generation. Um, maybe you've seen these tools where you just put in a few lines of text and you can create hundreds, if not thousands of images that are all different from each other um, based on just a few lines of text. There's also the, the voice synthesis side of things where um, you can take a, a recording of someone's voice and just with a few seconds of another person's voice, you can impart that style on the longer recording of the first person. Um, and in some cases you can just type in text and it will generate that speech for you. So the so-called text to speech space. So there's a lot of other sub facets that maybe the public hasn't interacted with as much, but uh, just, just as much impressive, just different domains. Right, and it didn't, it didn't happen overnight. There's been you know, folks like yourself <laughs> working on this for years and years. You know, yeah. this, this individual that I talked to, very deep into AI, deep into a lot of government projects and so super smart guy, but he kind of was poo-pooing chat GPT and he really tried to simplify it. And it was, yeah, you know, it's far from me to be able to debate a brain like that, but I would love to get your opinion. He said, Dave, look at this, you're talking about a database. It's got a search engine on top and some NLP. And I was like, come on, it has to be more than that. No, <laughs> can you explain yeah. how, how it actually works? Yeah, sure. So um, there is no database. There is no search engine. Um, everything that ChatGPT generates is generated from the information it was trained on. So it was fed a bunch of information and um, uh, a way to think of it is like a giant matrix of, of information, lots of, lots of weights and numbers in there. And those numbers mean something to the deep learning network uh, that sits beneath ChatGPT. And as it's trained, those numbers are adjusted to better reflect the information it was provided. And the goal of all these large language models, whether it be chat GPT or other things, uh, is to generate text. So it's a pretty simple thing where I'm speaking right now. And as I speak, you can probably guess what the next word I'm going to say is because you've heard people say things similar to me. It's no different than uh, when you're using your phone to text and uh, your phone is trying to guess your next word that you're going to say. That's actually a large language model sitting beneath your text application. And that's how these, these, these uh, things like ChatGPT work is they're just producing you know, what they think is the highest probability next word, but they're starting to do it because they've got so much information they've been trained on to create an entire paragraph of information, or in some cases, the entire pages of information, they've become so powerful. So people have this perception because what they're generating looks plausible, it looks human-like, that they are attached to the internet, that they are attached to some database, it's actually just a standalone model. The only thing that about them that's connected to the internet is the user interface that you're interacting with. So I wonder, you know, what's impressive about it is the speed with which it, it returns answers and, and text and the high quality of it. it's like, like the Ivy League level pros. 
Um, yeah. So my question to you, Ben, is like, what's the infrastructure behind that that enables this? <laughs> um, you know, if you if if you talk to anybody who's trying to buy GPUs right now, uh, graphics processing units, um, they will they will tell you about the challenges that they're facing in buying GPUs, and it's because things like Chat GPT require hundreds, if not thousands, of GPUs behind the scenes to facilitate that type of instantaneous response across multiple users, right? There, there, at one point, I think it was said that there had been over 100,000 100, people who used it within the first couple of days. And then within like a couple of weeks, it was a million users. And I don't know how many people are using it simultaneously, but you can imagine if running you know, these models requires, let's say one model um, requires 16 GPUs to run it. If you're serving multiple users, uh, it just starts to scale on, on a tremendous amount of compute required. So it's really high performance computing infrastructure just to run these models. We're not talking about training. This is something that's totally different about generative AI versus what folks typically think of as AI or machine learning, where you use lots of compute power to train whatever model you're, you're building, but then at inference time, you can do it on something sometimes as lightweight as your phone. Um, in this case, you need lots of compute infrastructure just to run the model. Um, for example, uh, the, 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 the language model that sits beneath ChatGPT, uh, or that sat beneath it, I should say, they have a new model now, but the one that, that sat beneath it back in November, um, just the model itself was about half a terabyte in size. So to run that, in memory across multiple GPUs requires lots of high performance compute infrastructure. And that's just for one instance of the model, right? And again, you know, if you're serving multiple users, it just scales to hundreds, if not thousands of GPUs running simultaneously in order to serve up uh, the users with low latency. So I, I want to get into what Dell's doing here, but while I have you, I have to, I have to pick your brain. Are you familiar with Eliza, um, the, the Eliza, they called it a chatterbox. It was developed in the sixties. You, you, you know, I'm, this? I'm not familiar with Eliza. I come from a, a scientific background, so I'm familiar of uh, Western blot and Eliza uh, on the, the technology <laughs> side. <laughs> but so, uh, yeah, so, I don't know about so, Eliza. So for on our the, audience, the language so, model, and, and anybody can can look it up on, on Wikipedia. They call it a chatterbox, and it was developed in the 1960s, and it was an NLP computer program in the mid 60s, and I think it, it ran on a, like a IBM mainframe or something. It was developed by a guy named Joseph Weizenbaum to to explore communication between humans and machines. And it was basically a pattern matching system. And people, when they used it, they thought the machine had emotion. Mm -hmm. We know that these machines don't I'm have familiar emotion. with this story, yes. Yes, yeah, so, so and, and I've had people tell me that ChatGPT is just pattern matching, Dave. They don't think of it as more than that, but, but I'm inferring from you it's more than that. No, I, I, don't, I don't feel like it's, I mean, it's not pattern matching, it is, um, what is the most likely word or, 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 you know, in the language community, we call it a token, which is usually a fragment of a word. What's the most likely thing to come next if we've said these things previously in this statement, right? It's just guessing with high probability uh, the, the next most likely thing to come. And if it's been trained on lots of high quality data, um, it will produce some very high quality output. And it's, it's quite convincing. Sometimes you think it's real, you think it's, 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 it has emotion, but uh, all it's trying to do is, is, you know, with high probability generate what is the next most likely word or, or token. I say please and thank you to ChatGPT. That's because, hey, you never know when the machines take over, you know, they'll remember me maybe. <laughs> okay, so. There's some people who are very worried about that, yes. <laughs> What are some practical examples of how businesses can use Gen AI to maybe improve business and even make or save money? Specifically, I mean, VCs are all thrilled now that you know valuations are down and people in tech are getting laid off and they can start a company and get the MVP in two months with 50K. How, yeah. how real is that? And what can you actually do today with generative AI? Yeah, so, you know, I think, I'll start on the image side, um, and then we can we can move to the language side. Um, I think one of the neat things on the image generation side is that um, there's there's a lot of uh, sort of quick start uh, capabilities to these these tools, right? So with a few lines of text, you can generate um, some speech, you can generate a song, you can generate images and things like that. If you're in a creative space where um, there's low 
uh, risk associated with maybe things being a little off or, or things, you know, not being entirely factually correct, but it's just to start the creative juices flowing. Uh, you know, these tools are very much in use right now uh, by creatives across industries uh, in the marketing space as well. Real estate, um, in architects, I mean, I, I saw something from one of the leading architecture firms in the world that uh, they estimate between 80 to 90% of their staff is using image generative tools on a daily basis. And it's it's not to generate the final product that they show the the customer and and kind of provide that walkthrough experience before a building is built or before a home is built, but it's more to get get the process kicked off, right? To help their teams kind of bounce some ideas around. And I think that is the the, the reduced barrier to entry in that space with image generation as well as uh, audio generation. Um, I think on the language side, there's a lot of different capabilities, and and you know one thing to to be clear about is that, you know, most of us don't have businesses that um, trade in images or audio or um, video every day. You know, a lot of, a lot of our business um, tends to reside in text. And, and, you know, that can be verbal communication, written communication, um, things that companies put out, as well as numbers, right? So if you just kind of step back and say, what's the market landscape look like for most businesses? Most businesses have numerical data and text data, but there's fewer businesses that really, you know, trade every day in image data. Um, so, you know, the impact, I think, on the language side is much bigger. And there's lots of you know, capabilities that these language models have. What I will caution people about is using language models to generate factual information. Um, I think it's been well described in the press um, as well as the academic literature that these models tend to hallucinate, right? The, in the spirit of trying to generate the next most probable word in a sequence, um, it's just trying to do that. It's, it's not necessarily trying to tell a lie or tell the truth. It's just trying to to, to go toward that objective. And sometimes in doing so, it generates false information. It can be very convincingly written. You know, it can be very elegant <laughs> in the way it's described to you. And if you're not an expert, you may not know that it's lying to you. It certainly doesn't know itself that it's lying to you, but um, that is a risk that, that is important to consider. So instead of relying on them for information, I think using them for their capabilities, and we can, we can kind of go one by one through the capabilities as to where I think the, the opportunities reside, but I think that's really where the power sits. And that's where a lot of companies that have started to deploy them today uh, are using them for. It's so true about the hallucinating. I, I was ego GPTing one day, and I, I was I was one at one time a writer for the Wall Street Journal, which of course mm. was never. I think I, I I think I was the founder of Computer World, which was not true, but it was it was fun to 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 see that. Yeah. <laughs> but but you got to be careful. Um, yes. So, how impactful do you think this is? I mean, the world's gone crazy over the past you know many months. Um, you, as a researcher in this space, have known the capabilities for quite some time, but it just feels like, do you, do you feel like we're at an inflection point in terms of you know, productivity, new ways to work, uh, yeah. new opportunities, new companies that can be started? Is it, are we, are we living that now? I mean, I wish I were 25 again. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's an exciting time. Um, you know, what's what's neat about what is happening today versus maybe a year ago, let's say, is that um, my parents, my grandparents, uh, they're they're aware of what it is that I do every day, um, and because they've had an opportunity to interact with these tools via free. Uh, easy to use web interfaces. And these capabilities are new, right? Like the ability to interact with these language models in the past, you had to you know, code it up from scratch and you had to have your own infrastructure to run it. And there were a lot of barriers to entry. And um, I, I think as of November uh, of 2022, you know, that barrier was, was reduced uh, by, by making chat GPT free and uh, placed on an easy to use, easy to interact with website. And it really exposed um, where we are in, in the, the AI space, specifically generative AI space to the broader public. And I think it's opened a lot of people's imaginations as to how they can use these tools and where the opportunities reside. So, you know, I, I think it comes back to this notion that um, amazing advances are made not through people sitting back and thinking about what could be, but instead tinkering. 
And uh, it's allowed people to tinker and play with it and really push the boundaries of what is possible, uh, where its limits sit, and maybe how to improve upon that. You know, there's companies being started around these ideas and folks publishing uh, things every day about uh, what could be and, and what is. So it's it's really exciting time. I agree. Um, I'm curious, what's Dell doing in this in this space? How how are you helping people implement your customers implement foundation models, large language models? Where's the juice? Yeah, <laughs> you know, uh, so these these topics have been um, hot conversation with every customer, regardless of industry vertical. Um, you know, we've we've had folks uh, the gamut from finance to uh, you know K through twelve education asking about how they can make use of tools like this, how they can implement their own custom uh, language models within um, their organizations, and the the motivations are varied. Um, you know, a lot of them are really interested in the capabilities that these tools offer. You know, I think the, the text summarization tools um, and capabilities are, are really powerful, right? So if you think about healthcare, uh, doctors have to look at lots of text and notes and try and summarize, why was this patient here six months ago? Why are they here today? What is the status of this patient? And the text capabilities of things like these language models can really help them. Now, one of the challenges, if you are, say, in healthcare, is that you can't just feed your information to an open API like OpenAI's ChatGPT portal because um, you're sending that information outside of your organization. There's certain regulatory uh, restrictions around that. So those types of customers are very interested in building their own tools. So we're helping customers create those capabilities uh, via our hardware as well as our services side of the house because we also recognize that um, not every customer has a dedicated team who has experience in this space and can you know, just grab the hardware and run with it, they're going to need some assistance along the way, uh, building and standing up their own instance within their own infrastructure. But what, what that does provide them with is security, privacy, control, and availability. So they own the entire pipeline and um, they don't have any of those you know, security and privacy concerns that they might have if they're going through a third party. Well, we've seen in the news, some companies have, have, have banned the use of Chat GPT because the employee mistakenly you know put you know a bunch of code in there and it was proprietary yes. IP and yeah you know, people generally ha many people hadn't understood that but um, you know you got to be super careful. What is I mean we talked a little bit earlier about GPUs. What what's the relationship between generative AI in the context of HPC? Does it require a supercomputing system to 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 run? And what's the relationship there, Ben? Yeah, so I, in my opinion, it really does. If you want to have low latency, uh, responsive system with multiple users, you really do need an HPC-like infrastructure. Um, you know, just, I gave the example of of the model that sits beneath the first uh, instance of of ChatGPT. Um, that model was public. Uh, in, in the sense that it was published on. It wasn't uh, open source, but the, the information about it was um, published. Um, the newest version uh, that sits underneath Chat GPT, that is less disclosed uh, because it is a hot uh, commercial space. So there's less known about it. But what I can say about that model that was released back in November of 2022, um, you know, that model, just the model itself requires around half a terabyte of memory to run the model. So if you start thinking about how do I do that across multiple GPUs, um, across multiple nodes in a system, because even if you have eight GPUs, that's not enough memory. So then you have to have multiple nodes. Um, and you know most GPU nodes are, are two to four cards per node, some cases six to eight. Um, but you can't, you can't host one of these things um, just on a single server under standard conditions. There are some tricks you can play, but um, you know, in order to get that sort of responsiveness, it really does require HPC infrastructure um, in order to have the, the, the low latency and the rapid communication between the various nodes of your system. So it is a very interesting time where all of a sudden everybody's you know, clamoring to get a hold of GPUs and, and, and low latency networking. And um, you know, we just had all sorts of customer conversations around this. So it's, it's exciting. Yeah, I mean, wow. I mean, infrastructure is a, is a big tailwind you would think for infrastructure. I mean, think about yes. when the internet you know, started to take off. It was like everybody needed, you know, routers and servers, and then, you know, Web 2.0 and 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 social media. Facebook was built, you know, big data centers, and they were sucking up a bunch of infrastructure. And the big data era, right? It was, 
you know, was still going on, I guess. And, and, yeah. and now, now, you know, the cloud even, right, sucked up a lot of infrastructure. Infrastructure just never goes away, does it? <laughs> so, <laughs> no. <laughs> um, I want to ask you no, about- No, it does not. It's changing a little bit though. You know, what uh, well, type so? of infrastructure? How so? You know, add well, a little color there. Yeah, you know, I think so. One of the the classic things that was sold in the HPC space were CPUs, right? And I think that's because the the jobs that were running required CPUs. Um, with generative AI, uh, a lot of these these methods and, and algorithms are built on the premise of GPUs. And you know, some people may have a handful of GPUs in their infrastructure. Some people may have none at all. And uh, what went from, you know, we've got a few researchers here and there making use of GPUs for training, and we just use them for training some models. Now you have to use GPUs in many of them for inference of these large language models, just running, you know, these large language models. It's really changed the game. So the infrastructure is still required. It's just a different type of infrastructure. And, um, you know, the, the GPU uh, memory intensive workload are new to a lot of folks in the IT space. Yeah, and we think all we always think about the processor as the you know the sort of brains of the, the system. Do you, do you buy this premise that increasingly the surrounding components you know are critical to not only system balance but system performance? Uh, you know whether it's I/O or you know network interface, uh, Ethernet types of connections that those increasingly become you know, it becomes more of a connect centric environment versus a processor centric environment. Does that premise hold true to you? I think all of it starts to matter, right? I mean, a system's only as good as its weakest link. So um, I do think that what was maybe classically not that dependent upon connectivity starts to become more dependent upon connectivity because these these various components do need to talk to each other. Now, you know, as with anything, there's the sort of uh, you know diminishing returns um, in certain space, and the the main key with a lot of these is that they're they're memory intensive workloads. So if you don't have available memory and you don't have the overall orchestration in order to make the optimal use of the memory space you have, then it's very difficult to run some of these workloads, some of these very large language models. But, um, you know, they're, they're, it, you're right in that, you know, networking speeds, and, and these are just networking speeds between the various nodes um, of the, the HPC system start to come into play. And that's why we see things like NVLink uh, being very important for inter-node communication with multiple GPU cards per node. Um, you know, we've just released at Dell, we've just released our XC9680 uh, PowerEdge server platform that has eight GPU cards in it. Uh, they can be either the uh, NVIDIA A100 or NVIDIA H100 cards. And uh, those are NVLink and the performance is outstanding. Uh, just, just yesterday, um, one of my benchmarking papers came out uh, on, on that uh, server and the results are just amazing. We've got some additional results come out where uh, we're seeing tenfold improvement over some, some benchmarks that were just run a few months ago uh, on um, a cloud system that used A100 cards. And um, it's it's very interesting to see the, the incredible in improvement in performance just by changing not only the card, but also the networking fabric uh, within the node, how the cards communicate with one another. How about security? We were at RSA last month, was, uh, you know, generative AI was of course the big topic of conversation. You know, it's two edged, you know, sword, right? On the one hand, yeah. hackers are going to use it to write better phishing, you know, hackers, oftentimes, you know, these phishing emails, the spelling errors, <laughs> replete with spelling errors, et cetera. Yeah. So they can use that to clean it up. But the flip side is humans can, can use this to prioritize. Um, what are your thoughts on that? Uh, I mean, I, you know, to qu quantum is another sort of security concern, but potential, yeah. you know, defense against security uh, uh, hackers. What, what's your thoughts on security and AI? Yeah, I think security is important. It's an important consideration. I mean, you know, you, you raise a very good point in that folks uh, for, for, you know, every set of good people out there, um, you know, in, in some regards, there's somebody out there too that's, that's thinking about how do I use this to to defraud someone or, you know, take advantage of a, a situation. And it's, it's very unfortunate. Um, I, I, I find it, you know, very unfortunate that that happens. But um, as with anything, I think we need to, you know, 
keep our eyes and ears open. Uh, I, I joke with folks that, you know, if somebody ran up to you on the street and said, I'm, a, I'm an African queen, queen or king, and, and I've uh, just been kicked out of my kingdom, and I need your bank account number and $5 million. Uh, if you just give it to me now, I promise when I get back to my kingdom, I will wire you $20 million. You know, most people on the street would be like, this is preposterous. You know, you're crazy. No way. But for some reason, you know, 10, 15 years ago, when that came via email, folks said, oh, okay, you know, that, that makes sense. You know, <laughs> people were giving away their bank information over email. Um, that same sort of, you know, sniff test, um, you know, needs to be foremost in people's minds when they start to interact with information, especially information that comes from people that they don't know that well, or news organizations that they maybe haven't heard of or, or have less trust in. So, um, you know, I think that level of skepticism is always important, uh, regardless of what medium we're using to interact with each other. And, um, you know, I was at a, a conference about a year ago, um, and there was a business professor, she was, she was new to the faculty there, and um, her area of focus was um, fake news. And she said that, you know, one of the things that she's learned as she's been researching this is that the most sure uh, source of information is the printed newspaper. And uh, it's kind of interesting to think that we're, you know, we've gone so digital with everything that, um, you know, printed press, it still has the most human touch to it, right? More, more people see that and interact with it and fix it before it goes out than anything digital even if it is from a trusted news source, right? And there's all sorts of things that go on on the, the outside news sources, uh, or excuse me, web-based news sources, right? Because they're paying per click versus what shows up on your doorstep if you're paying for the printed paper. So it is interesting to think about the printed paper is still being a, a more singular source of truth than even the website for the same newspaper. A fascinating conversation, Ben. We'll, we'll leave it there. Really appreciate you coming on today. Yeah, it's great. Thank you for having me. Really appreciate it. Yeah, you bet. All right, and thank you for watching our continuous coverage of ISC 23 and the innovations in high performance computing. You're watching theCUBE, your leader in enterprise and emerging tech coverage.